Sehr geehrter Herr Bundespräsident, meine Damen und Herren, Ladies and Gentlemen, Good evening and a very warm welcome. It's wonderful to see you here. I'm technically still before the curtain. My name is Almut Möller. I'm delighted to be invited to help facilitate the conversation of this evening. And I would like to encourage those, since we are going to have in a good European spirit at least two languages on the podium, uh, to make sure that if you are interested in translation from the German into the English or the other way around, please make sure you have a translation device with you for the time time being, this is the only housekeeping announcement that I have for you, and uh, we are now much looking forward to tonight's host, Boris Marte, the Deputy Chairman of the Board of the Erste Foundation, opening the evening. So, <laughs> welcome. Sorry for my voice in the beginning, but we had tough discussions the whole day. Dear Mr. President van der Bellen, dear Doris Schmidauer, welcome here on Erste Campus. We very much appreciate your presence here today, and we give lots of credit to you, Mr. President, entering the discussion today with us on some of the issues we all are deeply concerned about. Dear Francis Fukuyama, I come back to you later. <laughs> Dear Shalini Randera, director of the IWM, very happy about the joint initiatives our organizations take. Dear president of the supervisory board of Erste Group and Erste Foundation, Fritz Rödler, Manfred Wimmer, and dear Andreas Dreichel, CEO of Erste Group. Dear participants from Austria and abroad who spent all day in our think camp here on Erste Campus, you did a marvelous job and it was very motivating for us to keep on going. Dear participants of the Erste Foundation NGO Academy, where are you? Yeah, okay, good. <laughs> uh, representing leaders of civil society from Moldova to Montenegro and all the countries in between. Dear special guests, friends of the Foundation and bloody optimists, joining us for the evening lecture today. I welcome you in the name of Erste Foundation here in our newly built campus of Erste Group, a place from which one of the biggest financial institutions of Europe is managed and also a place of huge creativity, knowledge and ambition constantly striving to live up to the sentences of our statement of purpose, understanding the deeper correlations between our business proposition and its changing social contexts. Since Erste was created as a kind of social enterprise exactly 200 years ago, this very special story fuels our motivation and inspires our intellect in how we as Erste Foundation govern the shares we have in Erste Group in the deep conviction that creating access to prosperity has an intrinsic correlation to the stability of open and free societies. I welcome you here and you hopefully feel and sense the spirit of this legacy and mandate embedded in a very special atmosphere of a house being part of the fabrics of so many European societies. The Tipping Point Lectures as the central contribution of Erste Foundation to the 200-year celebration of Erste Österreichische Sparkasse line up great thinkers and researchers from all around the globus who will be our guests during this year. The lectures are not just another series of events, but are designed to open up space for reflection and inspiration on the highest level to embrace an urgent moment of responsibility. The Erste Foundation Tipping Point Lectures are exactly here to better understand in what kind of social, political and technological environment we live in today and how do we move forward. Now, you might ask or be interested why so many different chairs? Um, yeah, <laughs> uh, let me explain. And, and maybe you can follow me in this thought. Yeah. Um, one of the things that shaped constitutional thought of post-war Europe was 
La Responsabilité pour Autrui, written by Emmanuel Levinas. The Responsibility for the Other. One of the attempts after the Second World War, building the normative backbone for the European narrative. Where has this kind of normativity gone? Where has this kind of normativity gone? Europe was born out of the idea of the substantial part the other plays in building one own self, individually and collectively as a nation. This is why the attack on the other is an unambiguously managed fight against the idea of Europe itself. Every chair in this room is singular, reflecting the fact I hope in a hopefully comfortable way, <laughs> that every individual is singular. And sorry if the one or other chair might not be so comfortable, but it reminds us of another fact that being in the skin of some current individual identity might not be so comfortable in current 21st century Europe. Therefore, the struggle for recognition, Frank, as you put it, is maybe one of the explanation patterns which might lead us to the answers why the world is such a different one from what it was some years ago. So, why do we organize tipping point talks? And this is my final remark. Let's allow our minds to move in another world. The different ways how language works and how it mirrors the world of rapid change implies a whole new structure of knowledge and of ways coming into knowledge. That's key for politics, the companies, for education systems, and that's key if we want to manage transformation and innovation, not leaving people behind. That's why we started the Tipping Point Lectures, and we're so glad, Frank, that we can start this series with you. So, now I'm coming to you. <laughs> we are deeply thankful that you're here with us tonight, dear Frank. Dr. Francis Fukuyama is professor of political science at Stanford University. He currently researches and teaches there as Olivier Nomellini, senior fellow at the Freeman Spolli Institute for International Studies, and the Mosbacher, director of FSI's Center on Democracy Development and the Rule of Law. Dr. Fukuyama's book, The End of History and the Last Man, as you always mention, people forget the question mark, right? Was published by Free Press in 1992 and has appeared in over 20 foreign editions. His new book is called Contemporary Identity Politics and the Struggle for Recognition. Francis Fukuyama received his PhD from Harvard in political science. He was a member of the political science department of the RAND Corporation and of the policy planning staff of the US Department of State. The title of his talk today will be Identity Politics, the Demand for Dignity and the Nation State's Future. Dear Frank, the stage is yours. Thank you. Thank you. So, Boris, thank you very much for that extremely kind uh, introduction. Uh, thank you, Mr. President uh, van der Balen and Mrs. van der Balen for coming uh, to this. Uh, I hope I don't make you sit through too long a, a boring lecture, uh, but we look forward to the discussion. Thank you to the Erste Foundation and uh, uh, to all of you for coming out tonight to talk about what I think is a pretty important problem. Uh, which is really the crisis, I think the global crisis of democracy brought about by the rise of uh, nationalist populism. So I was doing other research projects. I, I run a center on democracy development and the rule of law. Uh, for most of my life I've been thinking about how do we expand the realm of democracy uh, and make more countries democratic, improve their quality, uh, move from authoritarian uh, governments to democratic ones. And then all of a sudden, 2016 happened. Uh, 
a number of very disturbing developments uh, uh, occurred that year. Uh, the election of Donald Trump as President of the United States uh, and the Brexit vote in Britain to go out of the European Union. And this came against the, the backdrop of uh, a really changing global environment. So for the last 30 years, since 1989 or, two, or uh, 1991, uh, we had been living in a growing liberal international order. This had been put together uh, largely by the United States, but with its allies in Western Europe, in the NATO alliance, in, uh, in the Far East. It had an economic component, uh, which was the system of free trade, the movement of uh, goods, people, services, ideas, investment across international uh, borders. And it had a political component, which was the alliances of the United States in Europe uh, and in Asia. And this was a really, really successful set of initiatives. Uh, the number of democracies in this period went from about 35 in 1970 uh, and peaked at something like 115 to 120, depending on how you measure a democracy, uh, by uh, the early 2000s. The global output of the world economy quadrupled. Uh, in virtually every respect, uh, economic conditions were uh, getting better, not just in terms of incomes, rising middle classes in places like China and India, but better child health, uh, infant mortality was going down. All of these things were uh, happening. Uh, and yet all of this reversed sometime in the mid uh, uh, to late 2000s. So you had the rise of a couple of very self-confident and newly assertive authoritarian powers, Russia and China. But from my standpoint, the most disturbing thing was this emergence of populism within established democracies, and in fact, within the two most established democracies, uh, Britain and the United States. Uh, and it seemed to me that it was really vital to figure out why this was happening and, and, and what was going on, because the entire third wave of democratization looked like it was being reversed. So you'll have to bear with me. I'm a political science professor. I'm going to give you a few definitions, because uh, there are many uh, understandings of populism. And I just want to run, th run through three, because it's important to be able to distinguish uh, between them. So the first definition is an economic one, a populist is a leader who promotes uh, economic policies or social policies that are popular in the short run, but disastrous in the long run. So, for example, Venezuela under Hugo Chavez and previous presidents, you know, opened eye clinics and gave out free food. Gasoline cost less than 10 cents a gallon in Venezuela. None of these were sustainable once the price of oil collapsed in 2014. All right, so that's the economist definition of populism. The second definition is more of a political style than anything else. A populist leader uh, tries to be charismatic and says, I have a direct connection with you, the people. And that's actually quite important because it makes a populist, I think, ipso facto anti-institutional. The populist says, I represent you, the people, and here are all these other institutions, like courts, like the media, like a legislature, a bureaucracy, and they're all standing in the way of my ability to deliver to you what uh, you want me to, uh, to give you. And therefore, populists go after all of those institutions. And so what it leads to is the democratic part of liberal democracy attacking the liberal part, the liberal part of a, a liberal democracy are all of the constitutional structures, the checks and balances that try to limit executive power. A democracy, I think, as all of us understand, is not just popular elections. <clears throat> it's also the protection of minority rights. It's also having a moderate government that really reflects the true will of the people. And populists tend to authoritarian politics because they don't like institutions uh, getting in the way. Uh, as an example of this, when Donald Trump accepted the Republican nomination in 2016, he had this remarkable line in his acceptance speech. He said, I alone understand your problems and I alone can fix them. 
right? This is something that Juan Perón would have said in Argentina uh, back in the 1940s. You know, it, it's just this personalism that, uh, that intrudes, all right? So that's number two. The third definition is that a populist, when they say, I support the people, oftentimes do not mean the whole people. They mean a certain kind of person, usually defined by race or ethnicity, oftentimes in terms of traditional uh, cultural values or a traditional sense of national uh, identity. And that does not correspond to the actual population that might live in that country. So again, uh, Viktor Orban in Hungary has said very explicitly, the national identity of Hungary is to be an ethnic Hungarian, meaning if you are not an ethnic Hungarian, you're not part of the nation. And on the other hand, if you're an ethnic Hungarian living outside of Hungary, and there's lots of them, uh, you are part of the nation. And that is problematic for I th reasons that I think are very um, uh, self-evident. So this allows us to distinguish between different forms of populism. So Hugo Chavez in Venezuela was a classic number one type populist, an economic populist a left-wing populist. He also was, by definition two, very charismatic. But according to definition three, that really didn't apply to him because he didn't have a racial understanding of who uh, a Venezuelan uh, is. Uh, I think that uh, Orban uh, probably captures, um, well, his, he has populist economic policies, but he certainly tries to be a, a, a demagogue, a, a charismatic leader. And he certainly has a very restrictive view of uh, who is a Hungarian and who qualifies. So there's, you know, so I think all of us in this room are familiar with the litany of leaders, new leaders that fall into this category. So it's Orban, it's the Law and Justice Party, the Peace in uh, Poland, it's Mr. Erdogan uh, in Turkey. Now we have a populist coalition in uh, in Italy, and Latin America elected its first. Northern European style populist in Jair Bolsonaro. Uh, most Latin American populists are like Southern European populists. They're left wing, they're not ethnically exclusive, uh, uh, they're more economic populists. But Latin America has decided to join the crowd, and so they elected a leader that's, you know, racially prejudiced, that has a very uh, uh, kind of fundamentalist Christian understanding of what Brazil should uh, should be about, and so he actually belongs in, you know, Germany or Scandinavia or uh, you know a, a region like that. All right, so this is a way to distinguish, I think, between populists of the left that are number one and number two, and populists of the right who tend to be number two uh, and number three. All right, so that's the that's the, you know, that's kind of the uh, phenomenon. Uh, that we're trying to um, is, uh, explain, and especially the rise of the uh, right-wing populace for reasons that I will get to shortly. Now, the question then is, why do you have this occurring in the middle of the second decade of the 21st century? And I think there are essentially three broad categories of reason. The first one is, I think, the conventional wisdom on this subject, which says, it's the global economy, right? So if you took a trade course in uh, university, uh, you would have learned that a system of free trade uh, raises the incomes of all of the participants. Everybody gets richer. So as I said, global output quadrupled in a 30-year in a uh, period. The economists were not wrong about that, but if you had listened carefully to your economics professor, you would have heard him or her say, not every individual in every country gets richer. And in fact, if you are a lower skilled, less educated worker in a rich country, you're liable to lose out to a similarly skilled worker in a poor country. And that, in fact, is what's been going on. So with outsourcing, with foreign competition, this globalized system of free trade that began to really intensify in the 1990s, after the fall of the Berlin Wall, uh, led to the export of lots of jobs out of the rich world. And it led to uh, an economic decline of an important part of the old working class in the United States. For example, between the late 1990s and <clears throat> 2015, average incomes uh, uh, 
for people in the lower 90% of the income distribution actually uh, declined slightly, which is really remarkable, a two-decade period in which people were actually uh, having less income, and the problem was actually, in a, in a way, doubly bad for men. There was an important gender distinction here because one of the things that was also happening at the same time was we were moving out of an industrial economy into a service economy where women just have a naturally greater, uh, greater role. And so, you know, you had a male worker in a factory, lost his job, making less money, uh, flipping hamburgers in a fast food restaurant, less money than his father or maybe even his grandfather, uh, and then uh, his wife or girlfriend being the major breadwinner in the family. And so it involves this big loss of, uh, big loss of income and a loss uh, of status. All right, so this, I would say, is the conventional wisdom uh, that would explain why this was going on. A second uh, category of reason has to do with politics. So right from the beginning, the rap against democracy is that it produces weak government. Democracies cannot um, make decisions. There are parliaments that talk, they jabber at each other, there's coalitions, there's interest groups, there's lobbying, uh, and all of this stuff makes it really hard to actually be decisive. And so there's a big uh, desire on the part of a lot of ordinary people to have a strong man leader who can just cut through all this blather, make decisions, and get things done. Uh, and in the United States, we somehow, for some reason, think that uh, rich, you know, corporate people are that kind of leader, and so there's been this tendency to want to, you know, pluck out um, uh, businessmen uh, to be leaders. I mean, I actually think that being a corporate CEO is about the worst training you can have for being a democratic leader, since corporations are actually pretty authoritarian, and especially family businesses uh, are incredibly, <laughs> they're like little, uh, you know, you have little emperors running them, and that's actually not such great training to be a, a, a leader. Nonetheless, You've had a number of people that, against the backdrop of weak government, have been elected because people think they're going to be really tough. You know, Abe in Japan, Modi in India, Donald Trump uh, in the United States. All right, so that's another, uh, that's another reason. But the th third reason uh, is cultural, and that's the one that has to do with identity, and that's what my uh, most recent book is about. And I think that there's been a tendency to overstate the importance of the economic motivation and to not fully appreciate the importance uh, of the cultural uh, side of this, the, the fact that uh, this is really a fight uh, ultimately over, uh, over identity. All right, so what is identity? The word identity and identity politics was really not used commonly until the 1950s. A psychologist, Eric Erickson, as far as I'm aware, was the first one that, that used the term, but it's actually a very old concept. And as I argue in my book, it goes back to a word, a Greek word, that Plato used in the Republic, thumos. Thumos is a part of the, uh, the soul that craves respect and recognition of its worth, all right? So we don't want just material things like food and drink and housing and so forth. We also want other people to evaluate us at the rate that we think uh, we deserve. And I think, uh, so with apologies to the economists in the room, but I think the economists have a kind of blinkered understanding of human behavior because they say, okay, people are, uh, they have desires, they have preferences, and they're rational, and they use their rationality to maximize their preferences. And that explains, you know, why human beings do what they do. Uh, actually, if you go back to the Republic, Socrates says, actually, isn't there this third part of the soul that isn't concerned primarily with, with material goods but really wants respect? And doesn't that overpower the desire for material uh, uh, well-being in many cases because respect is linked to the emotions? If you do not get respected at the rate that you think you deserve, you get angry, and that drives you actually to violence, to politics, to uh, a lot of other things. Now, the modern understanding of identity is a little bit different uh, because I think 
Thumos is a universal human characteristic. All people have it to some degree, and it's existed in every historical period. But there's a particular modern version of identity that, in my view, really starts with Martin Luther. All right, so Luther said, in God's eyes, what God cares about is your inner belief, your inner faith. God does not care about, it's easier to make this argument in a Protestant country like in Hamburg last a couple days ago than, uh, you know, than here in Vienna, but uh, you know, God does not care about all the rituals of the Catholic Church. You know? He doesn't care whether uh, you say the rosary or go to mass or, or do any of these, uh, uh, follow any of these rules that the Catholic Church says, because God cares about the inner believer, and that is really what's going to save you, and that was, that's what constitutes uh, Christian faith. And the entire society around you can be false and wrong and repressive because it is denying the authenticity of that inner self, which is a believer, and the only person that can see it is, is perhaps you, but, but God uh, above all, because it's not visible in your outer uh, behavior. And in a way, this sets up the modern understanding of identity, which is that we have a worth inside us that is superior to the evaluation of the surrounding society. In other pre-modern times, you would have said, well, tough, you know, you gotta conform, society sets these rules, so you just grow up and, and, and learn that you've gotta follow uh, society's rules. The modern version says, no, that's not right, because what's valuable is that inner self, and the rest of society is wrong and false, and it's the one that has to change. Uh, so you get later versions of this, particularly Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who argues that the whole historical process actually made us into a bunch of phonies, you know, that it created these external rules that suppress the inner being, and the purpose of, um, you know, what, what fulfills us is the uh, emergence of that authentic, uh, that authentic inner self. And if you think about it, this you know, relates to the structure of a lot of modern social movements. So something like the Me Too movement, uh, I think has the same structure in a way uh, uh, about the, the, the valuing of the inner self. And so what's the issue uh, involved with sexual harassment? Uh, it, it has to do with the fact that men are not valuing women as whole human beings, right? Woman has uh, knowledge, abilities, uh, you know, moral character, all of these characteristics. Man only cares about uh, her sexual uh, uh, attributes, and that is devaluing the woman. And, but it's a modern view because the lesson that you draw from that is not that the women have to just learn how to get along. The lesson is that inner self is the one that's valuable and the whole outside society has to change and that's what's happening right now, right? Men are going through a cultural retraining. Uh, they're learning that actually their rules are not the right ones and we need a different set of rules in relations between men and women that, uh, that respect the dignity of, you know, of the whole person uh, in uh, those kinds of relationships, all right? So that's the modern understanding of identity, and that is what's powered a whole series of political and social movements uh, in the last uh, two or three hundred years. Now, the first manifestation of identity politics, if you take my uh, understanding of it seriously, is actually democracy itself. So, in 2011, you had this vegetable seller, Mohamed Bouazizi in Tunisia. He had a vegetable cart. It was confiscated by a policewoman. He went to the governor's office and he said, where's my cart? Why did you take away my uh, livelihood? No one would give him an answer. You know, the policewoman spat at him uh, and he was in such despair at not even being able to get an answer from the government that he set himself on fire. That triggered the Arab Spring because many people in Arab countries, and every Arab country was a dictatorship at that point, saw themselves in Mohammed Bouazizi. The Tunisian government, the dictatorship of Ben Ali did not treat him, uh, did not treat Mohammed Bouazizi with the minimal amount of respect that a human being 
uh, deserves. And that is why they came out into the streets in their millions in Libya, in Egypt, in Syria, in Yemen, in many other parts of the Arab world because an authoritarian government does not respect its citizens. If it's a mild authoritarian government like Singapore, they treat their citizens like children. You know, the government knows better, you know, what's in your interest, but you're not grown up enough to really, you know, make that choice yourself. So we have to guide you. In a bad dictatorship, it's much worse. You're not uh, a, a human being. You're just cannon fodder or you're, you're just you know, part of the machinery of history that the government can use for its own purposes. And so a liberal democracy actually recognizes us, recognizes our dignity, and it does it by giving us rights. We have the right to speech, to association, and ultimately to political participation through the vote. We have a share in our own self-governance because the government respects us enough to trust us with something like the franchise. All right, so this is at the core of, you know, the democracy that I think all of us hold dear and it's done on the basis of a universal <coughs> recognition of citizens as uh, morally equal. They're equally agents. All men are created equal as the American Declaration of Independence says. However, there are other forms of recognition that are partial, and in fact, historically, this universal liberal form of recognition competed right from the beginning with the other major form uh, of recognition politics, which was, which was nationalism. And in fact, coming directly out of the French Revolution, you had these two strains simultaneously. So on the one hand, the French Revolution was about the rights of man and spreading the rights of man, uh, everywhere in the world, but on the other hand, it was also a manifestation of French nationalism. It was really the first modern nationalist movement. The French wanted to defend their country against all of the invading uh, powers of Europe and kick out the foreigners and have a, a, a country that they themselves uh, could control. And in fact, this liberal interpretation of recognition fought with a nationalist interpretation throughout the 19th century. So in Germany in 19, you know, and here in Vienna in 1848, you had a liberal revolution, but you also had a national revolution on behalf of the German people. And those two understandings of recognition, you know, uh, really define German history uh, from that point going forward. And ultimately, a very aggressive, uh, intolerant form of nationalism uh, took hold in many countries, leading to the catastrophe of the two world wars in, uh, in the 20th, uh, early 20th century. All right, so that's an early form of identity politics, and it's that national understanding of identity that uh, is making a comeback in many countries. Now, I would argue that um, Islamism is also, uh, it can be interpreted as a, a, a quest for recognition. And this would be particularly true, I think, for a lot of, uh, of the young European Muslims that went to fight for Al-Qaeda or on behalf of the Islamic State because they had a real identity conflict. You know, they came from families that had emigrated to France or the Netherlands or Germany. Uh, they did not feel comfortable with their parents' form of religiosity. They thought it was too old-fashioned and traditional, but they also did not feel well integrated into the society in which they were living, and so they suffered this kind of alienating inability to answer the question, who am I really? And I think what the Islamists did is to say, I'll tell you who you are. You are a proud Muslim. You're part of a large ummah. Uh, we are being persecuted and disrespected all over the world. And you can do something about that. You can join up and fight back uh, and make uh, uh, Islam a proud civilization uh, once again. All right, so, so this, I mean, it's, a, it's an honest, uh, difficult judgment because, you know, I think that some of uh, Islamism is driven by genuine relig rel religiosity and piety, but I think a lot of it is also driven by this desire to know who am I uh, and to accept a form of identity that unites you with a community uh, that gives you a home and a, and a sense of belonging, all right? Uh, so those are all, I think, 
different variants of this struggle for recognition, uh, there's a particular form that emerged in liberal societies in the course of the 20th century that brings us closer to uh, what's going on in the present, which is the identity politics that uh, you know, people refer to when they complain about identity politics. Uh, but it really starts in the 1960s in the United States in many respects where you had a number of important social movements. So you had the civil rights movement for African Americans, you had the feminist movement, you had movements on behalf of the disabled, the LGBT uh, movement. All of these represented groups that had been marginalized by the mainstream society. In the early 1960s, the mainstream society was white and it was male. And none of these groups had a place in that kind of a social order. And so there was a social justice struggle to be recognized and then to have um, you know, real compensation in terms of access to the job market, equal treatment under the law, uh, so on and so forth. All right? uh, so all of these movements uh, were responding to real social ills and they were very important in actually correcting ills like racial segregation in, uh, in the United States. But something happened along the route to um, the current form of identity politics, which was a shift in the way that parties of the left began to think about inequality. So in the 20th century, inequality was seen uh, oftentimes, especially in Europe, through a Marxist lens in which the big struggle was between capitalists and the proletariat. Uh, and the proletariat in the 20th century in most developed societies were white, white people, in fact, white male workers. Uh, and that was the object of, uh, of, the, uh, of the left, and that was the group that the left wanted to help. As time went on, uh, the understanding of inequality began to shift to pay more attention to these specific groups, often uh, you know, either women, racial minorities, other kinds of discriminated against uh, groups. Uh, and in a sense, a lot of the parties, you know, of the left began to lose touch with the old white working class that had been their core support uh, back in the 20th century. So, for example, in the United States, in the 1930s, under the New Deal with Franklin Roosevelt, uh, something like 80% of rural white Southerners voted for the Democratic Party candidate. They voted for the more left-wing candidate because he was going to do redistribution and, and help them out uh, economically. But as the conception of inequality began to shift in this identity direction, increasingly the Democratic Party began to lose touch with that old white working class uh, and they started to defect to the Republican Party. This really um, you know, was the reason Ronald Reagan was elected in the 1980s because he appealed to you know, white working class voters in a way that previous Republican candidates had not. Something similar happened in Europe uh, with the focus of a lot of the left on either environmental issues or on, again, these kinds of, I mean, the identity issues are a little bit different in Europe. You know, they oftentimes have to do with immigrants or other discriminated against classes. And something very similar happened where the white working class that had been the core of support, let's say, for the French Communist Party, uh, a lot of those people began to vote for the, for the National Front or for uh, another uh, right-wing party, all right? Uh, and this, I think, has led to you know, the presence. So I wanna make, I wanna make something very clear. Uh, a lot of people have accused me of blaming the rise of right-wing uh, populist nationalism on the left, and I am not doing that. I'm just trying to present a history of what happened in the evolution of the way that we think about left and right. There are many reasons why you have this right wing, and, and the economic ones are, you know, are definitely there. And so there's, there's many factors that led to the, the rise of this phenomenon. But there was a borrowing of the concept of identity by people on the uh, by people on the right from the left-wing version. And so, you know, 50 years ago, if you were a white person in the United States, you would have just thought, well, I'm, 
I mean, you wouldn't even have thought of yourself as a white person. You say, I'm, I'm an American, because that's what an American uh, is. Today, you're getting these white nationalists that say, no, I'm actually a minority that's being discriminated against by uh, elites. Uh, that, you know, I belong to a group that uh, is really not uh, privileged at all, uh, and this is being foisted on me by uh, people that really are privileged, which are all of these educated people in universities, in the media, and so forth, right? So identity, this, this framing of identity, I think, has moved from the left to the right, so it's not the left causing this, but it's a shared understanding of victimization that has uh, traveled uh, from uh, left to right. Now, one thing I want to <laughs> emphasize in describing the, ri the rise of the populist right and, and people that vote for populist parties is that, to some extent, this understanding of them as disregarded and disrespected is true. Right? Uh, there's a tendency of many people to say, well, this entire group of populist voters are just a bunch of racists and xenophobes. And, you know, they're white people that had been dominant in their societies. They're losing that position of dominance. They're resentful that they're losing that and they're just trying to get back their old social position. This is true for a certain group of people in that category. But I think it's important to understand that they actually have a case that they were disrespected and disregarded uh, by the elites that is a more reasonable one. Uh, if you look at, for example, what happened to this white working class in the United States, a good part of it actually followed the black working class into a kind of social chaos. Uh, and so today, among uh, low-skill white workers, you have uh, a vast increase in the number of single-parent families, increases in crime rates in neighborhoods where they live. You have an opioid epidemic that killed over 70,000 Americans and actually lowered uh, uh, life expectancy, male life expectancy for, for white people in the United States in the last uh, couple of years. And so it is very hard to say that these people aren't in fact um, in some sense, you know, doing uh, extremely poorly, but the cultural aspect of it is, I think, what's particularly infuriating to people. Uh, there's a very nice book uh, called Strangers in Their Own Land by a sociologist, Arlie Hochschild, that teaches at Berkeley, and so she, she interviewed a lot of Tea Party voters in rural Louisiana, and she has this metaphor, this central metaphor in her book where the, the way these people see themselves is they're all lined up in a, in a queue. There's a door in the distance. Over the door it says, the American dream. And they're all waiting to go through the door called the American dream. They're raising families, going to work every day. All of a sudden they see people cutting in head, ahead of them in line. Some of them are black, some of them are women, some of them are gays and lesbians, some of them are Syrian refugees. And the people that are helping them cut in line are basically, you know, frankly, people like you and me in, in this audience. They're educated people in the arts, in the media, uh, in the two political parties who really haven't paid uh, much attention to them. And I think that you can hear echoes of that in the populist movements here in Europe as well, that there is a kind of cultural snobbery of the educated, cosmopolitan, urban-dwelling, sophisticated, people that make up elites in modern societies against people that have less education, that don't live in big cities, that have you know, much more traditional uh, social and cultural values. And so there is, I think, a, a degree of justified resentment uh, at that kind of, uh, of disregard. So this is where we have ended up. Uh, I think that the cultural drivers, uh, which is this fear that immigrants are taking away our national identity uh, that is expressed by people on the populist right is a theme that unites virtually all of the new populist movements. The reason that 
immigration is such a big uh, policy issue for them is precisely because they felt that they used to define the national identity and that that's no longer true. And the national identity is now being undermined by, uh, not just by, by the, the immigrants, but by the elites that support the immigrants and, and want those immigrants to uh, come in. And that defines the, the political contest that um, uh, is ahead of us. So we're gonna have a panel. Uh, there's lots of things you could say about what do you do about it. That's an obvious question that I get asked quite frequently. I have some ideas, but I, you know, fundamentally, uh, uh, you know, it's a, it's a very tough question. But I don't think that you can actually begin to solve the problem until you have analyzed it properly and, and tried to understand uh, with a little bit of sympathy, you know, what is actually driving uh, people to vote uh, for these parties. The stakes are very high because I think the stakes are really about liberal democracy itself. Uh, these parties represent not a threat to democracy, you know, a lot of them are popularly elected, but they represent a threat to liberal democracy. That is to say, a legal and a constitutional rule of law that limits power. Uh, that's what's been eroding in Hungary and Poland, in the United States, where you know, Donald Trump has attacked the FBI and the intelligence community, the free press, you know, as enemies of the people. That's really, I think, what's at stake uh, uh, for all of us. So, uh, I guess, uh, thank you very much for your attention, and I really look forward to the uh, discussion to follow. Thank you. That's terrific. Thank you very much, Dr. Fukuyama. This is a brilliant food for thought. As you see, um, we have a layout here, and this layout is going to be extended. Don't feel too comfortable. It looks nice and cozy, but of course, uh, you are addressing big questions and difficult questions that we Europeans have been chewing on also for quite some time. Um, I would like to just say we are going to have a little break um, while you're seeing this, uh, while I get my other guests to the, to the podium, and I would like to explain something to you because you can also get engaged in the conversation. We have uh, organized it in a way that hopefully you will be able and willing to use and also those who are following the live stream maybe outside of this room as well. There is a tool that, yes, thank you very much, uh, that you can find on the website of the Erste Foundation that is called Votility. Uh, some of you might have already worked with that. It's actually a very simple thing. If you open the uh, Erste Foundation dot, uh, as you see here on the screen, Erste Foundation dot Votility dot de, <laughs> You are directed to a, a little blank spot straight away where you are very much invited to place your question or comment. Just I have two requests for you. Be snappy and if you want to, do provoke uh, and also make sure that if you care about who answers your question on the podium, please make sure that you also put the uh, name of the person you would like to address this to. I will do, I work very hard and do my very best to... Um, um, to really reflect this in our conversation. And um, for the time being, um, I would like to encourage you. I think it's always a very good practice. Um, you might know some of the people who are sitting next to you, but you might not. To have a little whispering break uh, while our panelists are getting ready and just uh, engage with your neighbor, quickly introduce yourself and see what are the couple of things that you take away from Dr. Fukuyama's lecture at this stage. Feel assured that you will have longer time to discuss later on as well, but please do engage and uh, get to know each other and chew on some of the issues now. And we'll be back shortly here on stage.
I can also see that you understand beautifully uh, the use of volatility because I see the first questions coming in. I would like to please uh, ask everybody to brace him or herself for a minute because I'm absolutely delighted to be joined here um, by a splendid podium um, and uh, some of Europe's finest thinkers and shapers. Um, I would like to introduce all of them to you. And then we will start uh, where Francis Fukuyama really reminds us uh, we should really be very cautious and very diligent and that is in the analysis. So what is it that we have in front of our eyes? Um, ich freue mich sehr, herzlich begrüßen zu dürfen den Bundespräsidenten der Republik Österreich, an Alexander van der Bellen. Sehr schön, dass Sie da sind, Herr Danke. Bundespräsident. Danke. We have uh, with us a pioneer in her field, uh, a European diplomat, Julia de Klerk Sachse, who has been working for many years in the EU's diplomatic machinery um, as a senior advisor to both representatives for foreign policy. And uh, Julia is also an expert on questions of identity in her own right uh, as an academic and researcher, and she continues to engage as a professor at Sciences Po in Paris and at Free University in Brussels. Tonight she's speaking in a personal capacity, so it takes more of her academic head. It's very good uh, to have you here, Julia. Then, <laughs> then I warmly welcome Ivan Krastev uh, to the podium, yeah. of course uh, a known figure here in Vienna, the chairman of the Center for Liberal Strategies in Sofia and a permanent fellow at the Institute for Human Sciences in Vienna. Um, Ivan has been writing a lot about these issues over the years and uh, I hear we can look forward to yet another book uh, that uh, is send off and um, Ivan uh, as somebody who has really been looking uh, at questions of um, the state of our societies and democracies we will get uh, to you shortly with that analysis thank you very much uh, for being with us thank you Carolina Vigora, a very warm welcome to you as well. Joining us from uh, Warsaw tonight, a so sociologist, historian of ideas and a journalist. Carolina is the co-founder and the head of the political section and member of the board of Kultura Liberalna, which is one of Poland's leading centrist think tanks and weekly magazines based in Warsaw, as I said. Um, Carolina is uh, one of the really leading voices on in explaining what is happening in Poland, and I think that is something also very um, um, important to this conversation, um, but of course uh, her inspiration goes well beyond that. Some of you might have read one of her recent pieces in the New York Times, and we want to talk about uh, that as well. Carolina, a warm welcome to you as well. Ich würde gerne noch einmal, ähm, Herr Bundespräsident, an dem Thema stehen bleiben, an das uns Francis Fukuyama jetzt eindringlich erinnert hat. Und zwar noch mal zu gucken, was, haben wir eigentlich, was sehen wir vor unseren Augen? Wir haben über den Populismus gesprochen, äh, über Diskontent, Unzufriedenheit, äh, über Menschen, die sich abwenden, weil sie sich von der Politik abwenden, weil sie sich unsichtbar fühlen, die Parteien wählen, die ihnen Dinge versprechen, die man sozusagen in der Mitte der Gesellschaft als ähm, Tabubrüche vielleicht empfindet. Wo sehen Sie, wenn man mal auf Europa schaut, die Ursachen für die Risse, die wir sehen in und zwischen unseren Gesellschaften in Europa? Ähm, während wir ja im Zuge der 90er Jahre, und auch darüber hat Francis Fukuyama ja eindringlich geschrieben, aus einer anderen Perspektive kam. Also eigentlich den Siegeszug der Demokratien, der Offenheit, der Liberalität äh, verkündet haben. 30 Jahre später stehen wir äh, hier und ähm, es wäre spannend zu hören, wo Sie sozusagen die Ursachen nochmal aus einer europäischen Perspektive für diese Risse sehen, die wir in unseren Gesellschaften erleben. Also ich möchte vorausschicken, dass ich mit sehr vielem einverstanden bin, was Professor Fukuyama gesagt hat. Allerdings ist immer die Frage, wenn man sozusagen mit dem großen Pinsel über die Geschichte und eigentlich die Weltgeschichte drüber geht, passt das auch für das einzelne Land. Was Österreich betrifft, finde ich, haben wir jahrzehntelange Erfahrungen mit dem sogenannten Populismus, 
ganz besonders mit Nummer zwei, Art Nummer zwei, die Sie genannt haben, der charismatische Stil. Ich erinnere mich sehr gut an Jörg Haider, der vor ungefähr zehn Jahren gestorben ist. Und er war ein, ein Meister dieses Fachs, das musste ich fast, würde ich sagen, neidvoll anerkennen. Ich will damit nur sagen, für Österreich stimmt das nicht, finde ich im Moment, dass wir hier, dass wir hier mit einem Rising Phenomenon der letzten 10, 15 Jahre zu tun haben, sondern wir haben mit ganz ähnlichen Entwicklungen schon lange zu tun. Was Europa betrifft, finde ich, ähm, sollten wir uns lösen von, dieser Kanin, von diesem Kaninchenblick auf die Schlange. Ich persönlich bin sehr zuversichtlich, was die Entwicklung der Europäischen Union betrifft und diese European Identity. Ich weiß nicht, warum wir uns dauernd einreden, dass wir hier ein Riesenproblem haben. Die, ähm, ähm, in, in, in einem gewissen Sinne glaube ich das ganz besonders seit der tragischen Fehlentscheidung der Mehrheit der Briten. Ich erinnere mich sehr gut an meinen eigenen Wahlkampf 2016, wo wir von Anfang an versucht haben, sozusagen Europa und die, das vereinte Europa, die Europäische Union auf die Tagesordnung der Diskussionen zu setzen, mit äußerst mäßigem Erfolg, muss ich sagen. Das änderte sich schlagartig nach der Brexit-Entscheidung äh, im Vereinigten Königreich. Äh, plötzlich war klar, ähm, ja, also man kann alles Mögliche kritisieren, aber austreten, austreten wollen wir doch nicht. Und da war noch gar nicht klar, welcher Rattenschwanz an Konsequenzen äh, die Brexit-Entscheidung nach sich zieht, sondern es war eine spontane, würde ich fast sagen, gefühlsbetonte äh, Reaktion auf die Brexit-Entscheidung. Äh, nein, zusammenbleiben wollen wir schon, bei aller Kritik. Und ich finde, das ist ein wichtiges, das äh, dass das eine Gefühlsregung war und keine intellektuelle Verarbeitung, oh Gott, und was ist mit den Zöllen und die Arbeitsplätze und dies und jenes, also lauter Kopfargumente. Ich glaube, das war eine Bauchreaktion, bei, zumindest bei den EU27 und ich bin mir gar nicht sicher, wie das heute äh, im Vereinigten Königreich ausschaut. Also Leute, wir brauchen das Vereinte Europa, dann sagen wir das doch mit allem, mit allem Elan, der uns zur Verfügung steht. Und dafür brauchen wir Kopfargumente und dafür brauchen wir sowas wie, wie, wie eine emotionale äh, Zuwendung an dies, also dass wir uns deklarieren als Europäer. Ich werde nicht müde zu sagen, wie im Europäischen Parlament, ja sicher, ich bin Tiroler, ich bin Österreicher und ich bin Europäer und ich sehe überhaupt nicht ein, warum ich da wählen muss, sondern das bin ich alles zusammen. Ein Südtiroler ist Italiener und Europäer. Ein bisschen Österreicher ist er auch, aber lassen wir, <lacht> lassen wir das beiseite. <lacht> Spreche ich lieber von Sizilien, vielleicht ist es weniger verfänglich. <lacht> ähm, also ich glaube, dass wir beides brauchen. Ja, die, diese, dass wir erklären müssen, warum wir dieses Vereinte Europa und möglichst freien Handel brauchen, offene Grenzen. Ein kleines Beispiel, wir waren neulich in Vordelberg und haben einen Betrieb besucht, was genau die produzieren, habe ich nicht verstanden. Es hat irgendwas mit Elektronik zu tun. Ich bin gut. Vor 20 Jahren haben die fünf Leute beschäftigt und heute 800. 400 davon in Vorarlberg. Exportquote 95 Prozent und 25, Menschen aus 25 Nationen arbeiten in Vorarlberg. Die Grenzen zuzumachen heißt, dieser Betrieb ist tot. Das kann man schon erklären was das bedeutet. Ich weiß nicht, ob ich klar gemacht habe, ich kämpfe persönlich mit der Frage, we need this United Europe, we have it, we got it, wir haben viel zu tun, damit es endlich handlungsfähiger und, und wie soll ich sagen, ähm, sichtbarer wird äh, auf der weltpolitischen Ebene, was Jean-Claude Juncker als Weltpolitikfähigkeit be bezeichnet, das brauchen wir dringend, und vielleicht können wir, und ich sage das jetzt aus dem Handgelenk, der Nationalismus, wenn man ihn richtig steuert, hat schon etwas. 
Also die Linken und Liberalen müssen aufhören, sich vor allem und jedem Begriff zu fürchten. Natürlich kann man über, über ähm, Patriotismus, ich, Sie müssen mich unterbrechen. Nein, ich wollte gerade Ihren wichtigen Punkt Euro dann gleich weiterreichen. Äh, genau. Der Punkt, den ich machen wollte, ist einfach, wenn wir über Europa reden, dann bitte schauen wir doch über die Grenzen hinaus. Dann schauen wir, dass wir einen Partner jenseits des Atlantik haben, von dem wir angenommen haben, er bleibt uns auf ewig erhalten. Wir haben größte Probleme mit ihm. Wir haben einen Nachbarn im Osten, mit dem wir ähnliche Probleme haben. Und wo bleiben wir, das Vereinte Europa, so wie es derzeit ausschaut? Das aufzugeben, das, was Ursula Plasnik einmal die freiwillige Verzwer Verzwergung mhm. europäischer Länder genannt hat. Wir müssen, wir müssen versuchen, das den Leuten nicht nur rational zu erklären, sondern mit Argumenten, die direkt ins Herz gehen. Und das ist, sorry to say, ein bisschen populistisch. Das können wir lernen. Ich würde das gerne äh, aufgreifen und Carolina Vigura fragen. Wir haben eingangs und heute Morgen, das haben Sie gehört, fand hier und einige von Ihnen waren bereits dabei, ja intensives Nachdenken bereits statt in einem Think Camp. Äh, Carolina, äh, Ivan und äh, Julia waren dabei, auch, auch Francis war dabei. Als wir eingangs gesprochen haben über die ähm, Ausgangslage, die Sie beschrieben haben, Herr Fukuyama, nämlich äh, 2016, der Brexit und die USA, da sagt Carolina Vigora zu mir, wir haben unsere Perspektive darauf in Polen und die müssen wir hier hören, denn ich glaube, das ist sehr wichtig, das haben Sie auch gesagt, Herr Bundespräsident, jeder hat seine eigene Geschichte und seinen eigenen Zugriff auf dieses Thema. Was ist Ihr Zugriff, Frau Vigora? Uh, yes, thank you very much and uh, also thank you for inviting me. I'm very delighted to be here. Well, of course, we have um, in Poland our perspective on this, because in Poland we must be first with everything. So when uh, Francis Fukuyama writes about 2016 and about the change uh, that which was brought by the Brexit referendum and then the, uh, the, the uh, US elections, uh, which resulted in victory of Donald Trump, then a typical Polish person would say, well, but we had Kaczynski already in 2015. <laughs> um, so over, always in the avant-garde. But to um, speaking seriously, I think it's, uh, it ext it's extremely interesting to ask, why now? Why 2016? Why 2015? And um, I extremely enjoyed the interpretation provided by you connected with Tumos, namely a passion that is so important for the human soul in Platon's philosophy. And I would like to supplement this interpretation with my own one, also basing on emotions, namely basing on fear. Um, one of the makers of uh, modern philosophy is Thomas Hobbes, who um, wrote a lot about fear, and he basically understood fear as the basis of political community. Now, in order to understand uh, and analyze, as you were calling us to do, why now, we would have to speak about two kinds of fear. The first kind of fear was connected in Europe with 1945, and it was the fear of the past. Europeans for decades were afraid of the past, and the motto, nie wieder, never again, was the most important motto. But with decades, with uh, um, the time has come, with the generational change, the fear of the past has changed and it, it evaporated, so to say. But as a very strong emotion, it left a void and this void was filled in by the fear of the future. And this is exactly what I would say that was the reason for what has been happening in the past few years in Poland, in the UK, in the US and other countries. Namely, it's the fear of the future that brought us um, in this situation. And 
when you were talking, um, Fran Frank, about um, identity, I thought about the Polish society and Polish politics uh, right now, which is definitely extremely focused on uh, being recognized, being recognized as an important actor in the European Union, being uh, recognized as a, a victim of the Second World War. And I thought, this is exactly about fearing the future and choosing what was behind us. Hmm. Let me bring uh, Ivan in, Carolina, on uh, the question of Central and Eastern Europe. And I think, I mean, you have been, I think, an important voice to many who really try to understand, especially in the cause of the humanitarian crisis, the refugee management uh, crisis, what happened actually in Central and Eastern Europe. And the struggle, uh, Carolina, you described, to make views heard, um, what is it that made Central and Eastern Europeans took the positions they took? And also more broadly, I would like to ask you um, to reflect a little bit more broadly on the um, observations of uh, Francis Fukuyama over you know, the tribalization uh, of policymakers that look at niches but forget the bigger picture. So thank you very much. First, I was very impressed when I saw that Professor Fukuyama has a book with the title Identity because people said that identity is like a sin. You cannot escape from it nevertheless how you're trying. Uh, but I do believe what you're saying something is important. There is a common trend that probably goes between all the people that you have been naming. Erdogan, Orban, Trump. But it does not mean that the explanation is the same or that the voter base is the same. I do believe that the problem of the white working class works very well for the United States, it's not going to explain much about Poland. Even the economic uh, uh, loss of uh, income and so on is not what Poland experienced for the last 10 years. So here's my explanation very much coming from the East European perspective. So when you have been writing the end of history book, America has a vice president, Dan Quayle, who was not famous for being very often invited on intellectual panels, uh, but he said, the future will be better tomorrow. And in a certain way, he turned to be wrong because the future was better yesterday. Uh, if you look at 1989 and how we are seeing the world, uh, the, the future looked better. But the very important part of this, the end of history paradigm was that if you do not have any alternatives to liberal democracy, the age in which we are living is the age of imitation. What others are going to do, worse or better, is imitate the Western model of liberal democracy, they can succeed, they can fail, but this is the game. And I do believe in Central and Eastern Europe it's very important because very genuinely we want it to imitate. But imitation has three problems and I do believe part of the resentment which you see in some of the Central and East European societies which very much was articulated through the vote for the populist voters was very much a revolt against imitation because was we're always imitating in our life. I mean, this is how we live. But it was a very special imitation in which you're not simply imitating institutions, but the original is telling you how well you're doing this. You're monitored, you're sanctioned. And from this point of view, being an imitator is a psychologically difficult position. You cannot have a real recognition for your success. You have the feeling that you want to be somebody else, but does it mean that your authentic self is not worse? If you are listening to the language of most of the Central and East European populist leaders is, we don't want to imitate anymore. Or in the most radical version, now you're going to imitate us. This is what's going to be, this is what uh, Prime Minister Orban basically said. Why I'm saying this? Because part of it is very much psychology. And the second story which is coming is that, and I very much agree with uh, President van der Bellen, is also because of the Yugoslav wars, because of many things, imitating the West in Central and Eastern Europe was very much imitating Germany after the 1945. But Germans' relations to nationalism was not easily to be replicated in Central and Eastern Europe. Germany has a very particular history because of the Nazi period. It was not easy to basically ask the Poles to view their nationalism 
in the way the Germans were doing this. So as a result of it, the European idea of identity and nationalism, in my view, was captured very well by a Bulgarian conceptual artist who took the photo of the famous Friedrich the Great uh, monument in Berlin. He's on the horse, and he took the person, and only the horse remained. Because he said, listen, all these historical figures, they're so controversial, Let's see, in Europe we have only monuments of horses, uh, because this is... Uh, but it never works, and I do believe this is extremely important. What happened was that these relations and trying not to recognize also the liberal potential of nationalism and inclusive nationalism remained all the symbols of the nation to the illiberal forces. And suddenly they started to speak about things, and they basically started to speak about ideas, uh, which was not necessarily theirs. And I do believe from this point of view, this is the most difficult story, particularly from the Central and East European perspective, and I'm going to let, end on this. The third reason, which we don't know how to talk about when it comes to the identity and the rise of populism, it's demography. Listen, in Central and Eastern Europe, you're seeing very much an aging societies, it's a very small nations, by the way, also not simply small nations, but which have been told by history that their existence should not be taken for granted. Can you imagine the French hymn or the British hymn to have the text of the Polish one? We have not died yet. Uh, so, from this point of view, this is extremely important that this type of existential insecurity, very much the result of demographic shrinking, a major exodus of people. Because the biggest story we never discuss about the last 30 years in Central and Eastern Europe is the biggest exodus of people. The Baltic countries lost around one third of their population. Just in the last 10 years, Romanians lost 3.5 million people. This type of an idea that you are living in a place which does not have value for its own inhabitants is, in my view, very important for the idea of the recognition and dignity. You cannot be happy being in a place that others want to exit. And this is why, nevertheless, that Mr. Trump and some of the others uh, look very similar when you look at them. The reasons that brought these people to power, the voting base that stayed behind them, the sentence of kind of resentment has a different sources. Mm. Uh, Julia, I feel we need a, a, a perspective from the EU here now because we have been talking about uh, often uh, the European Union being the sort of promise of the early 1990s, a treaty of Maastricht, and then the successive treaty reforms, trying to build really a political Europe, an ambitious European Union that goes beyond market, that comes up with cooperation in areas of security and foreign policy, that creates a European identity very uh, much through uh, a shared destiny of a single currency, etc., etc. So there has been a great sort of emphasis on, on deepening um, and, and, and bringing about this really Europeanization. And ultimately, I mean, if we look at the prospect of the European elections in May, we see um, forecasts are telling us, and we've done our own research at the European Council on Foreign Relations, saying that probably about one third um, of voters, polling is difficult as we know, but one third of the voters are just going to say nay. I mean, this is not where we, uh, we have a different idea. We're going to vote for parties of the fringes, of the extreme right, of the extreme left. We want to reform, as Ivan said, the union from within, but we have to ask ourselves the question, um, is this going to be a reform from within or is that going to be a destruction from within? And isn't, and here I come back to sort of my beginning of Maastricht and the early 1990s, isn't the political union that uh, member states wanted to create in the days now biting back at them? Because essentially what is happening is that political Europe is taking space. And we are going out and articulating and a lot of citizens in our countries are saying, we have different ideas. Is that a conversation that is uh, had in, in, in Brussels? How do you discuss with your colleagues and a sort of wider EU institutional perspective? Well, thank you so much. Um, let me maybe backtrack a little bit um, to the conversation that we are having about the politics of resentment, which then 
leads to that and why so many people are maybe going to vote a certain way, but just how, as, as someone who works on foreign policy, how does identity actually matter to my daily work? And I think we've heard a lot about resentment at the national level, we've heard a sort of American perspective, um, or Anglo-Saxon, if you will. We also heard a little bit how somewhere um, in Poland and Central Europe, this, this might be slightly different, but the phenomenon is the same, right? We have these politics of resentment, we have this demand for timos, for recognition. And, and we see that play out at the national level, but in, in my job, uh, and then from the perspective of, of the EU, we see that play out at two more levels as well. So we see it play out at the, the European level, the, the meta level, if, if you will, um, which we've heard already a little bit between maybe East and West. So who is being recognized? Who stands for the Union? What is actually a European perspective? Uh, North and South as well. Um, and then we see it at the global level as well. We, we have the same phenomenon, actually, and you touch upon that in your book at, at the very beginning, in, in the introduction. Um, we also see the politics of resentment. So we see a global order that's being contested by China, by Russia, for the same reason, saying, actually, no, we don't feel represented well by this global governance, by this system, by the liberal international order. We actually believe in something else. And I think there, there's sort of three parallel developments that help explain this a little bit. Why now? You know, why are we talking about this now? And why is identity all of a sudden uh, such an important topic for, for all of us? And um, I think there, again, we see now, instead of a sort of more universalist discourse, which is also the heritage of, of the European Union, if you will, a sort of civilizational discourse. There's a talk about the civilizational state. Certain, certain states claim that they stand for an entire civilization. It's their identity and that they are struggling now and they, they're only getting their their timos now on the global stage. And we are actually managing in, in foreign policy all, all these three levels, right? So we are seeing democracy contested at, at the national level. Um, we're managing the, the east-west divide, trying to, to forge a sort of common sense of, of Europeanness. And then also in, in foreign policy, of course, we need to deal a lot with um, how, how do you talk to us and make them feel recognized and give them the team without sort of throwing out the baby with the bathwater or breaking, <coughs> breaking the whole, whole shop by breaking up the system of global governance. Now, within the European system, I think uh, we have exactly that with the, the European elections now, the question how much diversity and contestation is actually healthy for us, and I, I would argue that it, it's really important to have that debate, and it's important, as I said, we have that debate in my field a lot. We, we, we sort of came up with a foreign policy and security strategy for the European Union. We talked a lot about, endlessly, about the northern and the southern perspective, what's more important, what's scary, is it Russia or is it terrorism? Um, what, um, what is more important, the sort of Eastern perspective or the Western perspective. Um, and, and we also need to sort of find a space within our union then to, uh, for this contestation, of course, the European Parliament is one place for that. I think where, where the challenge is perhaps, if, if we get these new parties and if they come in, if they want to really reform the system from inside, I think that's a very healthy development and that's actually a conversation we need to be having. That, that is a, a beginning of the, the politics of recognition. I think one of the, the problems that we had, and, and we heard a little bit about that is, uh, also Frank, you mentioned it in the beginning, is that a problem of liberal democracy hasn't been so much the, the institutional setup, but it's the way it was being practiced. And that some, you were saying that some of these, uh, the resentment is actually felt, it, it, some of these grievances are very real. Maybe the way that they're articulated, we don't agree with them, but some of these grievances are real. But what we've done, and I think Brexit is a good example of that, is to say, oh, these fears, you are wrong. You're wrong to be scared about this. You're wrong about your fear about the past, right? Let me give you a statistic, you know? Look here, you're just stupid, you just don't understand, but look here, I have the figures, you know? Guess what? Like, I mean, most people, if you tell them that, you know, they're wrong and they just simply don't understand and you're the smart one and you understand, 
how are they going to react? Well, they vote you out if they can, you know? So they think that you are actually the one that's wrong and you're the one that doesn't get it. So if we can get that conversation, I think that's a really important and healthy conversation that we need to have. I think the problem uh, with some of that is that, of course, what we've seen, at least with certain radical parties, and, and sort of Eurosceptic parties is that they capture the system only then to block it, and you don't have that conversation. And they, they only, all they do is to, to block things, but not to start a conversation how to fix it. And I think in general, that's uh, what we're seeing is that I speak for the people. I know what you need, but you know, I'm, I'm going to break all the institutions. We've built these institutions, as, as you were saying, to, to mediate and to find that space for dignity. But if you then come and you actually block the system, and, and I mean, we see a lot of MEPs who don't show up and they don't introduce legislation and they uh, don't join the debate. So I think that's if we can have a diverse conversation and try and reform the system from within, that's, that's really, I think, a positive perspective. If we're going to see a deadlock where we can't have that space anymore even uh, to have that conversation, I think that's a real mm. challenge and that's what we're worried about. Müssen die Europäer, Herr Bundespräsident, verstehen, dass die EU an die EU kein übersteigertes Harmoniebedürfnis zu richten ist? Ich habe das Gefühl, ich sitze ja in Berlin und ich meine, das ist natürlich ein Thema in Deutschland, das auch eine eigene Geschichte hat. Also es gehörte fast zu einem der Tabus, bis vor wenigen Jahren noch sozusagen in die Substanz von Europapolitik zu gehen und kritische Positionen zu formulieren, weil das interpretiert wurde als ein eine Kritik an der Europäischen Union insgesamt und das war unendlich schwer zu platzieren und man hatte das Gefühl, also man war ganz überrascht, was das für Emotionen auslöste. Müssen wir lernen, dass in der Europapolitik in dieser Arena eigentlich das gilt, was bei uns zu Hause gilt, in der Gemeinde gilt? Sie sind als Politiker natürlich erfahren, auch in der Vergangenheit auf diesen verschiedenen Ebenen. Muten wir uns zu wenig zu, zuzulassen, dass die Europäische Union eben auch dieses politische Wesen ist, wo wir diesen Schlagabtausch suchen und aushalten müssen? Ja, wieso nicht? <lacht> ähm, ich muss aber vorausschicken, Diversity ist doch etwas Schönes. Wenn ich etwas nicht möchte, dann ist es das, was die Nazis unter deutscher Volksgemeinschaft vertreten haben. Nicht? Die, die, die Vorstellung, dass ein Staat ein, ein homogenes Gebilde aus homogenen Menschen ist, ist für mich etwas Schreckliches. Also kleine Anekdote, neulich hatten wir ein Meeting, hatte ich ein Meeting mit Botschaftern aus den EU-Mitgliedstaaten und plötzlich sagt eine Dame zu mir, please explain Austria to me. <lacht> Und nach einer Schrecksekunde sagte ich, well, the first thing you have to notice is, Austria is not Germany. Hm. <lacht> Und das meine ich ganz ehrlich. Ich meine, wir haben tausend gute Freunde in Deutschland, aber dass das verschiedene Nationen sind, würde ich für unbestreitbar halten, von der Sprache angefangen. <lacht> Und Metternich soll angeblich gesagt haben, der Balkan beginnt in Wien am Rennweg. Ich weiß nicht, ob das stimmt. Jedenfalls, das finde ich ja das Wunderbare an dieser Europäischen Union, dass sich hier auf einer freiwilligen Basis inzwischen 28, vielleicht nur 27, bald mehr wahrscheinlich Nationen zusammengefunden haben, um gemeinsame Interessen zu vertreten, und das auf eine friedliche Weise erreicht haben. Ich meine, das muss man doch den Leuten sagen, dass dieses Experiment weltweit, soweit ich sehen kann, einmalig ist. Und das ist etwas, worauf wir stolz sein sollten. Und es ist ein Teil der europäischen Identität, diese Verhandlungsbereitschaft, dieses Stolzsein auf etwas, was man erreicht hat, auf friedlichem Wege. Und wir haben niemand ausgerottet am Weg dorthin. If we can be confident that this impresses also those that Frank, and we need to get back to you, uh, talked about earlier on, those that will actually say, the European Union and European cooperation is just not the kind of identity that we want. It's actually the, 
a complete exaggeration of this liberal idea of you know doing democracy, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I'm, I think we really need to fight some battles to win also those who. Um, and I'm looking constantly at this device, and there are so many questions that I struggle to structure. But one question is, why did you not uh, have a view from a, a, a populist um, a representative here, and you really go uh, substantively into the issues? There is a lot of questions to, to you, uh, Francis, on specific parts of of your talk. Um, what I I would like to do in the time that we have is to go one step further and ask if we want to win those again uh, in Europe and elsewhere that feel marginalized, unheard, um, if we want to dress them with the emotions uh, they need, what are the remedies? What is your take? And then we will have a tour around and we will see what others are contributing. So I think that I have two answers. One is on a more symbolic level, and then one is a more concrete thing. Uh, the symbolic issue has to do with national identity. Um, so we've had a lot, I've been discussing this a lot this week in different parts of Europe, uh, and I don't want to be misunderstood. I believe that the aspiration of the European Union to create a European identity that would supersede all of the national identities of the member states was a noble idea. Uh, and as a long-term goal, uh, it's something that still should be pursued. But the truth of the matter is that the real emotional loyalties of Europeans are to their nations and not to this thing called the, uh, the European Union. And if you need an integrative, and, and so in order to defeat the polarization and undermine the populism, you really need to reintegrate as many of those voters back into a larger whole. And I think that can only be done uh, at a national level. And it, and it remains the case that the nation is the deployer of power in, in the world still. That's why we build democracies uh, around um, nations and therefore, you need a democratic community of trust uh, in order to have a successful uh, democracy at a, at a national level. And therefore, you've got to worry about uh, something like a democratic national uh, identity. Uh, and I think that that's hard, especially uh, in Germany, because you can't even use a word that has, uh, you can't use the word nation without that conjuring up nationalism, this old you know, aggressive, uh, exclusive uh, understanding of nation, but it doesn't need to be that. You can also have a nation built around democratic principles, and this is what I call a civic uh, identity or, or, or a creedal nation, uh, national identity built around a creed or a set of ideas that have to do with constitutionalism, rule of law, uh, equality, and so, this is an idea, I think, that uh, is the only one that's compatible with the de facto diversity of, especially of Western European uh, states that actually do have lots of people from, you know, very different parts of the world, very different cultural traditions. You have to have a way of including them in the national uh, body. Uh, and I think a creedal identity is really the only way that you can do that. And it's, a, it's, it's something that's attacked from both the left and the right. So the, the right would like to build national identity around ethnicity and race, and that's simply not acceptable. But the left doesn't take the nation seriously. I mean, the uh, president was saying that, you know, that uh, patriotism you know, shouldn't be a dirty word because that's the basis of democratic community. But it is a dirty word for, uh, for many people on the left, and that's why I think a solution, the symbolic solution, does have to reside around the, the shaping of a, of a civic, uh, democratic, open uh, national identity. The practical issue has to do with immigration uh, because I think that the immigration system in Europe has got a lot of problems. This was really the trigger. So even, you know, Ivan, I mean, even in Eastern, in a country, or, or Carolina in Poland, it's true there are no immigrants there, but it's the fear that there could be immigrants that was really driving a lot of the populace, particularly in a 
declining population country. Where are people going to come from? They're going to come from the Middle East, from Africa, and you know, people didn't want that to happen. So even in countries with no immigrants, it's still a great fear that, that your country is going to end up like France or the Netherlands. Uh, so there are some fears about immigration that are much more legitimate than others. It is not legitimate to say we don't want immigrants because we don't want these brown-skinned people or black people from another part of the world. That's not legitimate. It is legitimate to worry about the fact that, you know, in 2015, a lot of the immigration, the migration was illegal and it was not under the control of any state. Uh, and this is something that could happen because Europe has really not secured its external uh, borders. And as long as that's the case, the Schengen system is going to uh, not really be a coherent system because you can't control who comes in, you know, through Greece uh, uh, and Italy. And so I do think that you can meet some of those practical fears, you know, by having a different kind of uh, uh, policy towards, uh, towards immigration. Mm -hmm. Not to cut it off, because I think immigration is good, but to make clear to people that, yes, you know, uh, the EU collectively and each member state, you know, individually uh, is in control of this process. Mm. Let me just um, uh, roll uh, into Julia's field um, what you said initially, that the real loyalty really is in the nation state. I mean, what if we see Europeans experiencing so much more what we in theory have been talking about and we have seen in practice um, happening and that is that nation states are actually not able to protect and to give that protection to vulnerability, which has led, I understand, to a different concept of Europeans uh, collectively saying, well, we need something that is about uh, telling people that really it's the, it's, the, it's the union that can be the protecting uh, force. That doesn't mean to sort of dissolve the nation states on the way. But in terms of a source of identity, would you agree that uh, in the longer term it really stays with the nation states or are there vulnerabilities not uh, increasingly exposed in the coming years? I think it's both. And um, I mean, I think the, as I was saying before, I think the, the first thing if we're sort of trying to, how do we solve this, how do we address this, is really to listen and take the grievances seriously, um, even if we don't agree with the sort of populist solutions that are, that are being put forward. And, um, and I think listen to those fears as well and, and take those seriously. And I think there, the solution can be both at the national and at the European level. And I think it's also on two levels. It's on one hand, on how do we articulate, how do we make the case for liberal democracy? And I think there, we've already heard it a little bit at the beginning. I think it's very uh, crucial. On one hand, we in Europe, and, and I think as, as sort of liberal elites, very often have, have overemphasized the, the logos since we're with the... the Timos and the Greek terminology, we've, we've emphasized the rational bit, the logos very much. But we also need to recognize the need for pathos, right? And that's what the populists are channeling. But let's not give them the field, because as you were saying, uh, Frank, earlier, dignity is really, I mean, that that's at the core of democracy, right? That's really not what authoritarian governments or populist governments are really giving. It's just that they're taking those fears much more seriously, but they don't have the solution. So one part of the solution is to, to make a more emotional, case and, and a sort of inclusive case for why we actually care about the things that we stand for and that we hope to stand for in the future. Mm -hmm. And that is about, and there I totally agree with Frank, about fixing liberal democracy at home, right? That's building up um, a civic literacy, we had this wonderful word earlier uh, in the Discuss morning. Discuss in the think tank, uh, think camp exactly. this morning. Mm. So I think there, I, I agree that that's important, that's at home, but I don't think that that excludes um, a sort of European identity, because exactly that, you call it creedal identity, I think in, in, in Europe a lot of the terminology we use is sort of constitutional patriotism, civic patriotism, and then we have the patriotism as well, right? So there is patriotism also in democracy, in, in the liberal creed, if you will. So we can, we can foster that, and I think if we do that on the national level, we already have the foundations, we have a big foundation for what will make up a sort of European identity and what makes up our commonality and, and what helps us solve things together. And that's my, my other point, that it's not just about 
how we talk or how we frame things, but of course some of these grievances are real. So some of the, the ways that we address them is by actually having policies that work, right? That address inequalities, that address <coughs> um, some of those fears. And I think there are fears, we've talked a lot about migration. People are also really worried about climate change, right? They're about their future. These are things that we can solve at the European level, or even the global yes. level much yes. better. So we need to connect the two political levels to get both at the at the identity, but also at the real policy solutions. Let me put this uh, to Ivan and sort of take the more abstract to the concrete. If you are an election campaigner of a middle of the road, uh, and you can imagine what that means for yourself, uh, for your own interests, and what would mobilize you to go voting in the European Parliament elections. If you were out uh, to snatch the votes from what a lot of you are putting me here on the screen is, is, can we counter the populist argument? How can we actually do that? What are the strategies? I want to uh, ask you and also Carolina in a second. We have focused a lot, about, uh, a lot on immigration. Is that really what ultimately matters even to countries in Central and Eastern Europe? Are we taking uh, too much the agenda of those who want to make us believe actually this is the case? Are we accepting a framing? What is your perspective from Central and Eastern Europe? And what do you advise to those who are still in the process of defining their messaging to unlock that potential of uh, majority in Europe that uh, seems to me does exist that says we fundamentally you know, think working together is all right, uh, not everything, but, but it's okay to do that. How do you unlock that? That's great. There was an American politician who said that in the middle of the road, basically you have a yellow line and dead animals. Uh, <laughs> and this is part of the problem that you see with a polarized political space. But here's the problem. We start with the idea of the conflict that goes in Europe being the conflict between the nationalists who believe in the nation state and those who believe that European Union is a solution. There was the big opinion poll that ECFR have been funding. The biggest problem is that in Europe, you have a vast group of people who believe that neither European Union works, nor the national state works. So from this point of view, this is not a clash between people who believe in the nation state against the people who believe in the European Union. And this is important. And by the way, it's very important to make a difference between the people who want to be hurt and people who believe that they're invisible. From this point of view, yellow jackets are quite interesting on the level of the symbolism. You're putting a yellow jacket on the road because you want to be seen. You don't have a message what exactly you want, but you have the feeling that people in power does not know what your problem is. And here is the problem, what kind of advice you can give. You're right about migration. By the way, there was two major kinds of an attempt to frame the European elections as a bigger kind of a referendum. One was Mr. Orban, and Mr. Orban said they're going to be a referendum on migration. On the base of the data that I saw, any party can use it. This is not the case. Not because people don't care about migration. Migration is a very important issue. And you're right that national community has the right to decide who to accept, onto what kind of uh, 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 what kind of conditions? And one thing good to be said about populists: they believe in the primacy of politics, because the liberal elites are telling to people, "Listen, we can do nothing <laughs> about migration, or we cannot do anything about the global market." And people said, "If you can do nothing, why I should vote for you?" And this is a this is not a stupid argument. But here's the problem: migration is an issue; it's not the major issue in most of the countries. What is even more, in Central and Eastern Europe, this is not true for every country, but it's true for Romania, Poland, Slovakia, people are much more worried about their own nationals living than they fear the foreigners are coming. So from this point of view, when we talk about migration, we should also be very clear what we are talking about. In Eastern Europe, corruption is perceived as a bigger problem than migration. And this is also one of a bad news for some of the populist governments in Central and Eastern Europe. According to this poll, people who are worried about corruption are much more likely to vote on the European elections than people who are worried about migration. So from this point of view, societies are divided in a different way. And we are trying to tell the story. But Mr. Macron is also wrong to believe that Europe can be also European elections is going to be just a referendum on nationalism. Because the story, you have, of course, concern. 
for example, in many countries, including Austria, people are going to see the rise of nationalism as a threat to the European Union. But do you know what? People fear much more the nationalism of your neighbors than your own nationalism. And this is quite normal, because some of these kind of a populist parties has been very much mainstreamed. And I do believe one of the biggest problem with this middle of the road, liberal political leaders is that in a certain way they're offended that people don't understand what they're doing. And I do believe from this point of view, Brussels is a great example of this. Anytime when you ask European Commission politician what is the problem, they said the problem is communication. If only people knew what we're doing, they're going to support us. But it's slightly more complicated because uh, they're winners and losers, and I do believe it should be very important. People started stop to trust some of these elites because we all the time were telling them that everything is a win-win game. And this was true with the white workers and globalization and so on. Not everything is a win-win game. And even on the level of the recognition, and this is my last point, Listen, uh, recognition and respect was used by Professor Fukuyama as a synonymous. But the word respect is also very popular in the Russian prisons. Uh, and when I said in a Russian prison, I want to be respected, it means that you should recognize that I'm stronger than you. You should recognize my power over you. And even in the language, not simply in the Russian prisons, of some big governments, to be disrespected means to be treated like everybody else. Mm -hmm. So from this point of view, the idea of the recognition is we want to be equal and different, so I want basically nevertheless that I'm different to be treated like everybody else, but for many people and for many governments, respect means I want to be treated according to my power. And if you are not treating according to my power, for me this is a disrespect. So from this point of view, it's quite important, and this is my last point on the advice. The advice is also nationally specific. If somebody believes that he can give an advice to the European politicians in general, be sure that on the base of this advice, people whom you are advising are going to lose the elections. Because, and here is a beautiful Swiss joke that I should tell you before this. And the Swiss joke is about, about three boys, nine, ten year old, a German, French and Swiss, and they're discussing where the babies come from. And the German boy said they're coming from the skies and the parents take them home, and the French boy start laughing and said for sure they're coming uh, from the bedroom. But then the Swiss boy became very nervous, and he said, do not generalize. It's different from canton to canton. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and I do believe in the case of politics this is true. <laughs> <laughs> Carolina, in terms of remedies, you have thought a lot about how the liberals need to change, what they have gotten wrong, and you argued in your piece against a, a liberal um, defeatism in a, in a way. So what is, the, what is your message to those who want to engage and who want to still reform uh, working together as Europeans and uh, who, who believe they have that wisdom? What is it they still need to learn a little bit more in order to have more of a wisdom? Yes, we have been talking a lot about wording, uh, wording and words and what words are uh, make us fear in this discussion. And uh, there are words uh, in the European discussion like fascist or na Nazis that are the, the most scary words, aren't they? But you know, in Poland, we have been living with fascists and Nazis for years. What do I mean? Well, in 2010, our ex-prime minister um, called the Law and Justice Party an NSDAP, uh, and he said it's a slightly uh, better version of NSDAP. So, uh, what is extremely important for the liberals is to understand that the only answer very often is just to call someone a totalitarian, a fascist, a Nazi, um, and this excludes any analysis of ourselves. So, it's of course true that the Law and Justice Party uh, in Poland, or Viktor Orban in Hungary, um, shows an authoritarian streak. So it's obvious 
that the law and justice has trampled the Constitution. Uh, it has attacked the uh, Supreme Court, etc., etc. But guess what? The answer was always, those are fascists, Nazis, totalitarians. This means that the language that the liberal elites have been using to oppose populists have blunted, the weapons have blunted. And in Poland it really comes with, um, with a lot of jokes because when someone says that in Poland we already have a dictator, then the, um, the, the, the opponents from the Law and Justice Party laugh and they ask, in this country, in which almost 40 years ago we have tanks in the streets, do you really say that we have a dictator? Do you see any tanks in the streets? And they, they call it a, a, a case for, 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 a, for, a, for a joke. So, you know, in, in order to, to change the situation, basically the liberals should stop using names and think really why the people choose the populist politi politicians. And it's really not enough to say, oh, because they are just you know, buying clients with the social um, uh, money that they're giving for the second child, for the first child, etc., etc. It's really not enough because the voters then do not feel talked to, they feel offended. So instead of using names, the liberals should probably think about what alternative vision would we like to propose to the voters so that they are convinced that a liberal democratic country or a liberal democratic Europe in this case already is better. And the liberals will also have to understand that people in, in Poland um, and people in other countries are eager to forgive breaking of, on the, of the Constitution for many reasons. For example, because the employees' rights have been broken for decades in this country. So why on earth should we now defend a distant group of judges? <coughs> and also, um, one must understand that in countries like Central Eastern European countries, which usually have problem with sovereignty in, the, in their history. The, the social policies introduced by the populist politicians seem to be a revelation. It's a change of the state that really cares for us. So again, what is the alternative vision which is convincing to the voters? And my last point would be there is this beautiful essay by George Orwell where he writes about catastrophic gradualism. Basically, this is a kind of thinking which assumes that history pr proceeds always by calamities. History always turns badly and even worse, every time worse. Today, a type of catastrophic gradualism in our liberal thinking is that we have already lost the battles. So Poland is lost, Hungary is lost, US is already a, a lost country for liberal democracy. But as liberals, shouldn't we really think about it differently? Shouldn't we really think mm -hmm. that it, it's all in our hands? And you of course can say that what I'm saying is naive, but I can only answer that what happened in 1989 came not from naivete, but it came from hope. And this is what we should have. Mm -hmm. It me that uh, very much you talk about hope. We have uh, some people here or elsewhere that feed in questions that are actually about fears and the panel is asked in its entire composition. When was the last time any of the panel had the fears you state that populist voters have had? There's a lot of uh, questions also that are intrigued by President van der Bellen's um, certain uh, interest and in some aspects of, of nationalism. Um, so you might uh, want to respond to that in a, in a minute. Uh, we have a lot of 
um, uh, questions uh, to Ivan about Central and Eastern Europe. When will Central and uh, Eastern Europeans stop believing in the EU dream? Um, a lot of things that span really a wide range of issues from the digital, um, so more questions and answers we can provide, absolutely, uh, to assure you this was also not the intention of the talk. Um, Verena Ringler, the brave curator uh, of these Tipping Point talks 2019, reminded me, well, we are at a starting ramp. Uh, this is going to accelerate and we can ask questions. We need to be serious in wanting to find answers, but it's just about all right uh, if we have some more questions and we can discuss them in the course of the evening. I have one final uh, question to you, President uh, van der Bellen. The theme of tonight, how do we foster democracy in Europe 30 years after the fall of the Iron Curtain? Ihr Amtskollege in uh, Berlin, Bundespräsident Steinmeier, hat kürzlich die Demokratie eine Staatsform der Mutigen genannt. Der Staatsform? Eine Staatsform der Mutigen. Wo brauchen Demokratinnen und Demokraten in Europa in den kommenden Monaten und Jahren besonders Mut? Na, wenn es wahr ist, dass der Populismus fortschreitet, dann sind wir wohl alle gefordert. Und da braucht man auch ein bisschen Mut, den Mund aufzumachen. Und das betrifft nicht nur Politiker, das betrifft, betrifft uns alle. Ganz generell würde ich sagen, wenn es stimmt, dass die liberale Demokratie gefährdet ist, dann glaube ich, wir müssen sie auf dem nationalen Niveau äh, verteidigen. Es wird zu spät sein, wenn wir darauf warten, dass die Europäische Kommission äh, oder sonst das Europäische Parlament oder wer immer äh, uns wesentlich dabei hilft. Das muss hier und heute verteidigt werden und nicht irgendwann. Insofern habe ich meine, ähm, wie soll ich sagen, bin ich zurückhaltend, was Interventionen in anderen Ländern betrifft, wo ich mich nicht auskenne, wo ich so wenig über die polnischen Verhältnisse zum Beispiel weiß und so weiter. Also darüber will ich gar nicht diskutieren, aber was Österreich betrifft, bin ich der Meinung, wir müssen das hier tun. Und mit wir meine ich wer als, äh, als die Politiker. Das Zweite, was ich noch sagen wollte, ist, wenn jemand ein Patriot ist, in, Europa, in Westeuropa, dann muss er oder sie doch sich darüber im Klaren sein, dass man transnationale Institutionen braucht, um die, so merkwürdig das zunächst klingt, um die nationale Souveränität in Europa zu verteidigen. Weil wir alle zu klein sind, sogar Deutschland, Entschuldigung, weil wir alle zu klein sind, um unsere Interessen im Weltmaßstab zu verteidigen. Dieses Argument gilt natürlich nicht für die USA oder für China, aber für jeden europäischen Kleinstaat gilt es, dass wir eine transnationale Institution bilden müssen und glücklicherweise haben wir sie schon. Das ist die Europäische Union. Und wenn wir sie nicht hätten, dann müssten wir sie jetzt schleunigst anfangen zu bauen, wenn vielleicht nicht genau in der gleichen Struktur, darüber kann man diskutieren, aber dass es etwas in der Art braucht, um, um im Weltmaßstab nicht überfahren zu werden, das liegt für mich auf der Hand. Ich kann eines für mich sagen, ich verdanke der Europäischen Union das Wissen darüber, was eine Deutsche von einer Österreicherin unterscheidet, als ich in meiner Zeit der, des großzügigen Studiums von Erasmus mit einer Österreicherin zusammengelebt habe. Aber das ist nicht das Entscheidende dieses Abends. Das Entscheidende war, dass wir etwas versuchen wollten, nämlich uns darüber zu verständigen, inspired by Francis Fukuyama, where we stand, 30 years after the fall of the Iron Curtain, where I, uh, as a, um, a teenager, certainly was not based in Berlin, but in a different part of the country, and followed with, with admiration uh, the force of hope that Carolina Vigora described. Um, we seem to have entered for a while a time when Europeans, those that believed in this big liberal uh, idea of democracy uh, taking its space and place in, in history, felt discouraged. Um, but I got the sense in the course of our conversation that there are actually already quite a lot of 
answers or beginnings of answers, at least of where to start thinking about fixing things. And uh, on that note, I would uh, very warmly invite you all to thank very much uh, Dr. Francis Fukuyama, who inspired uh, this evening, uh, Herr Bundespräsident Alexander van der Bellen, Julia de Klerk Sachse, Ivan Kastev, and Carolina Vigura. Thanks to all of you for contributing. I'm very well aware that I didn't do the job properly in that there was so much more in there. Um, the tipping point talks will assure that there is more room for conversation. Join me in thanking uh, the panel, and then we are all invited by Boris Marte here for the reception outside where we will chew, uh, continue to chew on these difficult uh, questions. Thank you very much to all of you. Thank you.